comes doing that. They can't really do that. And in Luke uh, 9.18, as early as 9.18, Peter and the disciples declare that Jesus is the Messiah. And so, I know you guys are still writing that down. So hold on a second. If you want to just write down the references, I think that'll be pretty good too. So if we look at disciples in Mark, there's not a really good portrayal of the disciples in Mark. Um, they don't understand Jesus. They reject Jesus. Um, they deny Jesus. And um, as an example, too, they're just really, really dull. And so if you actually have your um, biblical text there, let's go ahead and get that out and look at just one or two of these. So let's look at Mark 4. Actually, Mark 8. Let's do that one first. So the text there just says, his disciples answered him, where can anyone get enough bread to satisfy them here in this deserted place? And so this is the story of the feeding of the 4,000, right? The disciples don't get it. You know, um, this doesn't seem all that bad for the disciples. You know, none of us probably would, if we were with Jesus, would think he's just going to make bread appear out of nowhere. But this is actually the second feeding. Um, just previously, in the one chapter previous, we've got uh, Jesus feeding 5,000, and the disciples didn't get it then either. And so, you know, right after that, Jesus is going to feed the 4,000 again. They still don't get it. They, they don't get the, who this Jesus is. They don't get, you know, what Jesus can do. Um, and also, let's look at 4.13. And I'll just read uh, 13 there. Jesus said to them, do you not understand this parable? Then how will you understand any of the parables? So there you see Jesus yelling at them. You know, you're a dumb student. Don't you get this? You know, what else can I do? You know, so Jesus is frustrated here. These disciples, they just don't get it. They're dumb. And so also we see in the predictions there. Um, the first prediction Peter says, no, Jesus, you shouldn't, you shouldn't uh, have to go and uh, be crucified. And Jesus you know, rebukes him and says, no, no, I have to. You don't get it. You don't get what I'm doing here. And in the second prediction, uh, after that, uh, James and John say, well, after you're dead, who's going to have the power? Can I have it? And so really, they don't get, those, uh, get Jesus, and they don't understand. So the disciples here they're not really portrayed in this, this positive light that we've got. And we also see um, them rejecting Jesus after the crucifixion. You know, after he's been arrested, um, they reject uh, this Messiah. So you might be asking yourself, you know, if Matthew and Luke paint this rosy picture, this, this pristine picture of the disciples, you know, they... They get it. Why does Mark have this, this you know, bad picture of the disciples? Why is Mark doing this in his gospel? Um, and one of the things that we can use to try and figure that out maybe is look at sort of an intertextualization. Um, and people in seminary love to make words up. That's not actually a word, but we, it sounds like it. And if you do a Google search for it, you'll find it everywhere. Um, but intertextualization, all that means is looking at other biblical texts to inform um, what you're looking at in the particular text that you're looking at. And so with that one, we can look at uh, the book of Job. The three friends of Job um, really sort of play a similar role that the disciples do in the Gospel of Mark. Um, we can also look at the covenant structure of the Hebrews, of the Israelites. Um, again and again, 
the, the Hebrews are rejecting the covenant, rejecting God's laws, but God brings them back. God tries again to bring them back. And so we see that as well in the Gospel of Mark where the disciples don't get it. They reject Jesus, but Jesus is calling them back, and Jesus is trying again um, with them. So we have that type of intertextualization. But that doesn't seem to explain all of why Mark would do that. You know, the, um, Luke and Matthew, they could have done the same thing. Uh, and so uh, I think a contextualization or looking at the historical perspective, what's going on in the context that Mark is being written will help us figure out you know, what's going on. Because really that's, that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to figure out what the theological purpose of Mark is by just looking at one of these narrative critical methods and in particular discipleship. So that's our ultimate goal here is to try and figure out a theological perspective. And so what we'll do is we'll use historical criticism. Now if you remember from Dr. Nichols' lecture, the Gospel of Mark was written somewhere between 65 and 70 CE. And so we should probably look at the, um, what was going on in the Roman Empire at that time to see sort of what was influencing the Gospel of Mark. Now one other piece of information that you, we want to know is that the Gospel of Mark, we believe, was probably written in Rome itself. And so we'll actually look at what's going on in Rome um, during this time period. And so right, uh, right before the Gospel happens, we have the Great Fire of Rome, where we have 10 of the 14 regions of the Roman city, the city of Rome, completely leveled. And that's not just like um, you know, there's a little bit of fire damage in 10 of the 14 regions. They're completely leveled. There's no buildings left. And so we have that going on. And another thing that happens is that Nero blames the Christians for it. He says that they're, they're the ones that started this fire. And so we have great Christian persecution starting you know, in 64 CE and going you know, years and years after that. And so uh, that's sort of the context in which we have the Gospel of Mark being written. So we can look at, now you've got this so you don't have to write it down, it's actually in the, the handout there. We've got a letter from Tacitus um, that sort of lets us in on what's going on outside the Gospel. So if we look at this, first then, the confessed members of the sect, which, is, which means the Christians there, um, were arrested. And next, on evidence furnished by them, a huge multitude was convicted, not so much on the count of arson as hatred of the human race. They were covered with wild beasts' skins and torn to death by dogs. Or they were fastened on crosses and, when daylight failed, were burned to serve as lamps by night. Now, this is really um, any type of persecution that you've got going on in Rome, this is sort of what they did. They sent them to the Colosseum, and they were torn apart by the animals. Um, they used crucifixes and all that. This is, really isn't um, all that unique. The unique thing for our, for our perspective, though, is in that first paragraph there, um, where it says, on evidence furnished by them. So what's happened is that the Christians, have, some Christians have been arrested, and what they're doing is they're turning in other Christians to save themselves. Um, so they're, they're using their knowledge of who else is in this Christian sect to save themselves so that they don't get sent to the uh, wild beasts. They don't get put up on crosses and burned. And so what we've got going on is Christian turning against Christian, brother against brother, mother against uh, father. And so um, that is sort of the context in which Mark is writing. And so how does that inform Mark's gospel? How does that inform what we're studying with as far as the narrative criticism of discipleship? Um, and if we look, let's go ahead and look at that, because this is one of our strongest pieces of evidence um, for this being connected to the great fire. If we look at Mark 13, verses 12 and 13. 